those of you who live in one or two hours ahead of of us here in western in Indo western indonesia um i firstly i would like to welcome you all into the first international webinar organized by the society of indonesian science journalists or CSJ in, in short it's me dina rohmeringsi i am a freelance science journalist who is the president of CSJ. So as you all know, uh, we are gathering here to discuss, uh, to discuss what elements are actually making the good science stories. And we already have two award-winning science journalists here. We have Yao Huo Lao and also Yunanto Wiji Utomo. I'm sure that you all you can't wait to hear their presentations uh, sharing their perspectives and also tips and strategies. But before that, I think uh, I would like uh, to introduce you to Mbak Dewi Safitri. I think she's already overcome the green screen. Mbak Dewi? Yeah, um, I've become less glamorous now, but yeah, more realistic. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, so, um, but Dewi Safitri is the Secretary General of CISJ. She is a science journalist at CNN Indonesia and has been active promoting science journalism among uh, students and local journalists here in Indonesia. So it's my honor to invite her to give some opening remarks about this webinar, please, Mbak Dewi. Thank you, Dina. Um, hi, everyone. A very good morning or, or good afternoon or probably even good night, uh, depending on your current geographic location. Welcome and thank you for joining us on Office SISJ's global Zoom session. Uh, we've had many Zoom sessions before, but this one um, we dub a global one because um, obviously um, it presented speakers uh, from outside Indonesia and also participants uh, from uh, many other countries as well. Uh, any of you not familiar with the SISJ? Again, it's the Society of Indonesian Science Journalists. Uh, the society is currently six years old, not that old, but not that young either. And it has become a host to all of us, uh, about 60-ish science journalists all across the archipelago in Indonesia. Uh, we are, to be honest, at the moment, a bit overwhelmed uh, with joy, that is, and surprise that this initial session managed to garner attention and uh, your participation. So again, thank you to any of you joining us from India, from the Philippines, from Malaysia, from Nepal, and I have been informed even from the US. Uh, and of course, um, welcome and thank you as well to all fellow Indonesian science journals and communicators uh, welcome to all of you. We hope that the session today will yield uh, meaningful knowledge from the speakers and also meaningful engagement to further our interest in science reporting. Um, my name is Dewi. Uh, as uh, Dina mentioned before, I am a science journalist. Um, I currently work for CNN Indonesia and currently um, have the honor of sitting as the Secretary General of the SISJ. Um, we run this particular session knowing full well that although science reporting may be less mainstream than politics or business or disaster journalism in our respected, in respected countries, to mention just a few of the leading genre of journalism in, in Asia, but there are many of us that are actually highly passionate about reporting on science. Uh, this pandemic, one of its blessing in disguise, um, if you happen to believe in the concept of blessing, that is, is that it prompts us all to become a science reporter. Everyone in the newsroom suddenly becomes science journal newbies. And uh, with that, mishaps and hilarity often on suit. 
and unfortunately some uh, misinformation or disinformation too. But obviously not all members of the media are doing um, a bad job of um, reporting the uh, pandemic. Uh, in fact, most of us, I dare say, are doing our best to cover and present the most coherent reading from this trying time, trying our best to inform the public. And one of the best versions of these presentations has just been awarded a couple of what, two weeks ago. Um, Yunan Utomo, a fellow member of SISJ, is here to talk to us about his idea and execution behind the winning piece of story that eventually won uh, the Pathway Award. Yunan, thank you for coming and talking to us in this session. Also, how you all I hope I pronounced uh, the name right. Uh, apologies in advance if, if, if that's um, mispronunciation, how you um, A fellow science journal from Malaysia who won the One World Media Print Award for his mesmerizing story on snake bites in Indonesia. Yeah, you put us to shame with, with his story uh, and, and well done. Uh, and what Yunan and how will show us uh, today is that the potential from this region in science reporting is massive. Uh, these are but two individuals making their marks in the global stage. But there are many more of us here. So Southeast Asia can certainly, certainly contribute more to the world stage through our reporting on science. And so with that, hopefully uh, this session today is a start to all of us starting to engage, to network, and maybe to collaborate, hopefully to collaborate more in the future. And with that, I wish you all the best with the session and with reporting on science ahead. Have a great session, have a great discussion and engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Thank you very much, um, Mbak Dewi, for such an insightful remarks. And I think we all agree that actually Southeast Asia has a great potential to improve science journalism in the region. Um, so I think we all we are all optimistic about that. And the stations is. Uh, hopefully the start uh, of the struggle. So, um, okay, we can now start with the presentation. Uh, firstly, I would like uh, to introduce uh, our speakers here. The first is Yo Hua Lao. Uh, Yo Hua is a freelance science journalist from Ma Malaysia whose bylines have appeared in Science, um, Science News, Mosaic, uh, Hakai, among many others. And he has won several awards uh, in the past, uh, but most recently he won award from One World Media in the UK for his story on snake bite cases in Indonesia. So Yo Hua will talk about uh, narrative writing in sense reporting and share some of his tips and strategies. And we have Yunanto Wiji Utomo. Yunanto is a science journalist uh, in Compass.com. This is one of the leading uh, digital media in Indonesia. And he recently won, the, I think, one of the most uh, prestigious award in science journalism. It's the Coffley Award in the US. He, he got that for his animation series, Spirion. He got the silver award for that. And Yunanto will talk about uh, science stories in the digital age. So we'll start with Yohua uh, because I think the basic questions of uh, science writers, what do we have in mind is that how we translate science into enjoyable stories. Because we know that science is full of numbers, science is full of calculations, methodologies and everything. And how could we create human story out of it. And if we have uh, two or three research papers that confuses us, how can we make it uh, a story that is, that is enjoyable? For example, like the snake bite stories or other yoga stories that maybe you all uh, have read. So I give the floor to Yoha to share his uh, presentation and ideas. Please, Yoha. All right, thank you, Dina. Um, th uh, good. 
Good day, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. So it's of course my pleasure to speak uh, on this platform. I'm not sure if I can live up to the, the expectations that Dina laid out for me. Um, you know, I, I, I definitely did not plan to talk about how to uh, read research papers and make it uh, interesting. But I, I think, uh, well, 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 we'll see. I have 20 minutes, right? I, I told Dina yesterday I won't be using PowerPoint much. Then overnight, I decided that I don't look that well, so I want to use a lot of PowerPoint. Um, I, I need to uh, share my screen, but I can't because you, you have disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah. Uh, as you wait for that, um, so congratulations, Yunan. I'm so honored to be sharing this uh, panel with you. As uh, you know, um, I've always wanted aiming for that Kafli prize, but it has always evaded me. So. Well, now that you have taken one, hopefully we get another one from this region very soon. Um, okay, so can I share screen now? Yes, okay, hang on. And uh, Buck Debbie was, was right in, in, in the beginning when she said that uh, there is so much potential in this uh, region for science reporting. Um, and I'm, well, I'm going to share, I'm going to talk about narrative writing in science journalism and um, how we can use that, yeah? Okay, um, so you guys can see my screen fine. Dina, can, is it okay? Okay, you can hear me fine too? All right, okay, then let's, uh, let's start then. I have uh, 20 minutes, right? Tell me if I'm running uh, over time, yeah? Okay, uh, hang on. I should show my own face a bit so I can see how I look. It's very important for me. <laughs> All right, okay, so narrative writing uh, in science journalism. So, okay, uh, my name is Yao Hua. Uh, it's pretty hard to read, uh, Yao Hua, but you can just call me Yao. So, what I'm going to talk about today um, is, is still, this is the outline of uh, what I'm going to share with you all today. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of elements of journalism because um, I, I think we are mostly all journalists here. And so, but why am I repeating this? Because narrative is storytelling. And sometimes people get confused between just telling stories and then forgetting what the journalism part is. So I'll start with some elements of journalism and then we'll go straight into what is narrative journalism? You know, why do we need it? How does it work? And when can we use it or when do we not use it? Okay, so to start, just, just to be clear, um, I use plenty of reference um, you know, to guide myself too. So these are some of the, um, I think the most useful references uh, that have helped me in my career and also for this talk. So the top one here that you see is really important if you want to do narrative uh, writing in science journalism or just narrative nonfiction. It's uh, Telling True Stories. It's a collection uh, edited by Mark Kramer and Wendy Call. So this I say would be like the top choice of a book if you want to do this kind of uh, writing. Um, and then writing for story is helpful. Uh, but just for feature writing in general, uh, Dina would know this, like my top recommendation is Art and Craft for Feature Writing by William Blundell, and then also A Writer's Coach by Jack Hart. But of course, if you just want a, a free resource that's really, really helpful, always go to the open notebook and that's online. Okay, so let's go into it. Elements of journalism. Um, you know, so there's this very classical book, right? And they say that, um, so, what, so what is uh, journalism? Like the, the purpose of journalism is that we provide the information to help citizens make, uh, make sense of the environment, make sense of what's happening in the world. And we help them, uh, we give them the information so that they're able to make very good decisions about their life. Yeah. So, so, so that's what journalism does. And so we, our first obligation is to the truth and we are loyal to the citizens, not to politicians, not perhaps not even to our employers you know, in, in the newsroom, but to the citizens who are our readers. So we must always keep this in mind uh, in no matter what form of writing you want to do in science journalism. Yeah? So it's the truth as, as best as we could get it. And then our loyalty is to the citizens, the readers or the consumers of our journalism. Okay, so bear this in mind. So, um, so what is narrative journalism? Now, there are many names, uh, different names for narrative journalism. Um, some of it is called uh, narrative writing, narrative nonfiction, creative nonfiction, literary journalism. There are many names, but basically it is storytelling. Okay, we are storytellers. Narrative journalism is storytelling, but we are telling 
true stories, real stories, real people, real events, real data, uh, real actions and real consequences. So we record all of these observations and then we report it. So what's the creative part? You know, it's called creative nonfiction. So what's this creative part? If it's all real, where is the creativity? The creativity is, to me, I, the way I interpret it, is how we take all these different real events and then we line them up. You know, how we arrange them. Uh, how, to what degree do we show it, right? And, and that's all creative. That's up to us. And, and of course, the editors. Yeah, I can never forget the very important editors. It's up to us to arrange these things so that it forms um, what we think is like the best story to, to tell, to present all this real data, these real events, to then convey you know, a key message that would help the people, the readers, yeah, to, to learn more about what's happening, to make sense of what's happening so that they can make better informed decisions. So that's the creative part, yeah? So, <laughs> this thing keeps showing up. Uh, so why do we need narrative journalism, you know? Um, why do we just not do straight up reporting? Well, I would say that um, narrative journalism, it, it's, um, it creates an experience that is intellectual, so there is the knowledge, um, but it's also emotional, right? It, it, it triggers feelings in the reader so that they don't just understand what, what happened, you know, but they also feel it. And once they feel it, it really hooks on. Um, they, it has a personal kind of an engagement. They don't just understand it in their mind, but they actually feel it in their heart. And they, they have a sense of, uh, they sort of like unite uh, or they combine or whatever it is, they, um, the, the characters in the stories, right? And then so they feel it. So when you apply this to journalism, it helps them make better informed decisions about their lives. I'm saying this so many times again. <laughs> All right, yeah, but you get the point. So it's the intellectual and the emotional experience that uh, can be delivered by narrative journalism. Um, so how does it work? Okay, so this is, I, I guess, you know, when, um, when uh, Dina was saying that tips and strategies, so I guess this is what she meant. Um, of course, I should really say, I've not done that many narrative writing, um, but all the ones that I've done, I would say have been pretty successful in terms of the impact and the, uh, how people accept it, yeah. So, okay, so narrative journalism, how does it work, like, how could we use it? We actually borrow techniques from uh, like really creative writers, uh, the novelists, the script writers, and the directors. Yeah, we take their techniques and then we use it in our, uh, our writing, our, our reporting. So how does it work? Um, think of it like this. Um, if, you, if, you, if you think of like your, your, favorite, um, your favorite movie, right? A scene from your favorite movie. Imagine how it is. In that scene, some things move. Some people, there will be characters and then they um, do something, something happened, right? And then that something happened lead to something even more happening. So there's always action and then changes. So it goes from one scene to another, and then another and another, and it carries you along, right? For us in science journalism, in narrative uh, science journalism, it's the same. We take scenes, we write the scenes, we report the scene, and then another scene, and between these scenes, we put in our data. I'm calling it data here, yeah, but it's really like the, maybe the, the information uh, that, that has no scene. Um, it could be a data, right? It could be like um, Malaysia has just released 30,000 tons of carbon into the atmosphere uh, in the last month. This is it. There's no scene. It's just a data, yeah? So scene, scene, data, scene, data, and then you, you basically mix it up. You use, by using these scenes, you use the action within the scenes to link up and explain the data. Yeah. Because if I just tell you, Malaysia released 30,000 tons of carbon into the atmosphere last month, period. Now you do not know what to make sense of that. There's no context. Who's, who, who is releasing? It can't be the whole country, everyone releasing it, right? Like who's releasing? What's the consequences? Yeah. Who's reacting to it? 
So then you can actually put the scenes in there to link and explain the data. Um, and it sort of gives what I call it, like life meaning to the data so that people, the readers know it, know it in the context of like real life. So I'm gonna, no, so there'll be events uh, called change and causes, right? So the way to do it, you know, I, I said that we have to borrow techniques from the director. So when we write it, and when we report it, we try to imagine that we are writing with a camera. So writing with a camera. Um, okay, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try, yeah? Um, maybe easier if you sort of close your eyes and you don't see me now so you don't get distracted. So if I, okay, now I'm, so I'm sitting in my room across me. Uh, I'm just gonna use a scene uh, uh, just, just across uh, outside of my room. It was, uh, it's a beautiful, bright Saturday morning in Kuala Lumpur. It was cool, there's a light breeze in the air and in one of, and in the condominium, two floors above the swimming pool, a lady walk, a lady walks to her balcony, smiling and singing, whistling a nice tune. She grabbed clothes and then she started drying the clothes on a rack. Behind her, a man wearing only a sarong walks up. He's smiling too. He's smoking a cigarette. As he approaches the lady, he takes a cigarette and then presses it into her shoulder. She screams. During the COVID pandemic, Malaysia has seen a 30% spike in domestic abuse cases, causing an unprecedented mental abuse, mental health uh, emergency for the country. So that would be that, yeah? So the data is the second part. But before that, I use a scene. Of course, I made that up, yeah, I made that up. But before that, there was a scene, and then it leads into the data. Okay, and of course that I could follow up with another scene or even more data, but I always have to go back to, uh, you know, some sort of scene to, to create that emotional experience for the reader. Now, uh, okay, I stumbled a bit with the, uh, with the experience just now, I mean, with the example just now, but um, I could have gone a bit, a lot more into the details of the lady or of the man uh, or even of the environment. No, I suddenly mentioned COVID, but there was nothing in the scene that links it to COVID. So if I had done my reporting, um, or if I had more time to think about this example, I, I would have you know, put in some elements of COVID in there. For example, I could say, um, it was a work day maybe, or I say it was a Saturday, right? Then it would be, um, I, I could say that, um, that a man maybe was jogging uh, by the swimming pool because the gym was closed uh, due to the COVID pandemic. And above the man, um, this lady was, you know, airing or, or drying her clothes. And then her, another man came up behind her and then pressed the cigarette, uh, the red hot tip of the cigarette into her shoulder. Yeah, pretty graphic there. Yeah, but um, but you, you get the idea. So you, you saw right with a camera. Um, when I started describing the, the, the scene, the camera was wide shot. You know, like the swimming pool, uh, a bright day, a sunny day. Um, then I, 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 then I zero in, I, I zoom in onto the lady, right? Um, if I even describe some of her actions, then you zoom into her, maybe her hand, her clothes. And then I pull out a bit and then you see this man approaching behind her, right? And then I zoom into his cigarette. And then to the point where his cigarette presses into um, her shoulder, right? And I could, then I could again zoom into her response. Then if I say she screams, and then if at the point I say that the scream carried across the pool, then we zoom out again, right? And then finally, the next data comes in and I say that Malaysia has like a 30% spike in domestic abuse cases. That's like zoom out to the whole country already. So when we do narrative writing, and this is a bit detailed already, but we, we write with a sort of like a camera in mind. Yeah, okay. So, so if there's any tip, this is one of it, I guess. Uh, so, but how, you know, like if we take, oh, that was a made up example, but for example, in my snake bite story, like we could do a, a starting scene could be a, a farmer was bitten by a snake. You know, I described how the scene was like, 
Then the next scene, the farmer went to the hospital, but the doctors were trying to save him, but then they failed to save him. Done, done. So a lot of action in there. The data then now comes in. I'll put this into context. So 3,000 people a year die from snake bites uh, in, in Indonesia. Blah, 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 blah. Now this is just all made up, yeah? Don't, don't, don't quote this. Uh, if you want, you can just go read the story itself. And then I, once I deliver that data, then I say, then I go back to the family again. Oh, the family is now broken after the death of the, 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 the breadwinner. Uh, you know, and then I, and I put another piece of data that 90% you know, of the snake bite victims are, are poor. Uh, uh, I just want to see a chat to make sure that nobody's saying that, uh, okay. Because once I was just speaking, speaking, and nobody could hear me. They were saying in the chat, but I didn't know. Okay. Um, and, you know, then I add another piece of data, right? The 90% of the snake bite victims are poor. Now, of course, after that, I can either do more data, data, or I use another scene to then carry on to the, sort of like the next data, yeah. Um, so, well, that's, well, well, you know, the, the whole mosaic story, was I think almost like 4,000 words, uh, something like that. But actually it can just be summed up into a few points of data. Indonesia has, nine, has 270 million uh, population, about one third of them work in farms or forests where there are a lot of snake bites. We do not know how many snake bites there are. You know, uh, Dr. Tri Maharani estimated as many as 130,000 a year. We don't really know. Uh, there's very few antivenom, um, they're not very effective also. So and the snake bite response across the whole country is either wrong or weak. Right? So then the whole idea of the story of my approach is also how can the country do better? And so this is it. This is the whole sum up thing, right? But then why do, I, why do we need it to write like 4,000 words on this? You know, I could, this is only like, you know, not even 50 words. The idea is to bring not just the intellectual experience, but also the emotional experience to the readers so that you can make them feel the farmer, you make them feel the doctors, who were so helpless. You make them feel Dr. Tri Maharani's, uh, um, you know, um, well, frustration, I guess, in a sense, uh, but also her passion. Um, then, then we have a better hope of triggering response in the common citizen or perhaps in a policymaker. So how does, um, so to, to do all that, right, you have to do plenty of reporting, like really plenty. You know, I made up that scene about that woman, you know, and then her, the man behind her pressing the cigarette. But if I really need to have that scene, I, I must be able to find the, the evidence for that. Either I speak to the victim herself, I speak to the man, I speak to a neighbor who's just, you know, peeping Tom and then observe everything happening, or I look at the police report. So plenty of reporting. What do you need to get? You need to get the details. You need to get quotes from the people involved. You need to have enough details and quotes, spend enough time with the subject that you are able to pierce into their inner world, like what they really feel inside. You need to spend time to do that. You need to be able, yeah, their inner worlds basically, and just lives. You have to report for the lives of the subjects uh, in, in your story, the characters in your story. Because if you're not able to bring the characters to life, then the emotional connection is, is much, much weaker. Yeah. Um, details are, what's the time now? <laughs> details are very important. Um, because... You have three minutes. Okay, okay, Ken. Uh, yeah. Where am I? Okay, sure. All right, then we'll skip this then. <laughs> so how does it work, right? Um, it is, uh, remember that it is... Um, like when does it work? Like when would we use narrative journalism and when would we not? I, I, this is just my opinion. Yeah. I, I, I think narrative journalism works really well when it is a story that you really want, that deserves and you want to um, make it intellectual and emotional. And I find that it, it usually works best um, or it's most needed, sorry, it's most needed for stories on people or communities who are neglected on topics that really very few people care about, <clears throat> on issues that are neglected, right? Because if it's an issue that everyone really cares about already, you do not really, really need like narrative journalism. You know, you can just write something and people will all read it and they will all be triggered and they would all um, respond to it. But if you're writing about, you know, just a, a common, just a teacher, a teacher in a small place 
not celebrity, nothing special about this teacher, but you have found something really unique and worth sharing about this teacher's experience, then narrative journalism will have, you have to use narrative journalism, I think, to really bring it out. Okay. And it will only work if you have really good access to the characters and to the actions, to the story. If you want to write about the teacher, but you have no access to the teacher, like he or she refuses to talk to you, um, or she or she is the only person you could talk to and you cannot talk to the people around them, the people they work with, the people who are affected by this teacher's uh, actions, then you almost cannot do narrative journalism because you cannot do enough reporting to get the details, the quotes, the inner worlds and the lives of you know, the, the, all these events. So I would say, uh, it, it, I don't think it works when the story is very urgent, when the data is king, you know, like, like the data itself is so important um, and all the other descriptions, the, the emotions are secondary. So when it's urgent and the data is the really most important thing, I, I would say um, it doesn't work that well, narrative journalism. Or when you have no access and you have no resources, when your editors tell you to please report this in like two days, <laughs> yeah, you probably can't do narrative journalism. Um, yeah, actually, I think that's all. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that's all for me, Dina. And if there are any questions, we'll, we'll take them uh, later on. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I think I was okay, going really you. fast. Yeah, I hope you guys could follow there. Yeah. Oh, it's a very interesting explanation. Okay, uh, yeah. And I think it's, you know, we thought that uh, science reporting only an intellectual activities, but then you, you underline that it's, it, it should be emotional. There should be emotion, emotional elements to be inserted in the piece. And that's, uh, that's really interesting, I think. So, um, two people already sent questions here, uh, but I think we'll go to Yunan first so that we will have discussions after a Yunan presentation. So, Yunan will uh, present uh, science stories in the dig digital age. So, okay, so we have we have heard how uh, Yao Hua, you know, made his stories, I mean, wrote his stories uh, in narrative writing approach. But then uh, Yunan, uh, he has uh, ideas, he has experiences uh, in how to present these interesting stories, because we now live in the dig digital age and uh, people, they have their cell phones, laptops, but maybe mostly they don't want to spend um, even 15 minutes for long form articles. But then Yunan here uh, have some creative ways to, to share. Okay, Yunan, uh, please. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Okay. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, in this occasion. Uh, I'm Yunan, I'm a science journalist from Compass.com. Uh, currently, I'm a manager for uh, a channel called Visual Interactive Compass. This is uh, uh, an interactive channel from Compass.com, which exists since 2016. And I'm sure you all uh, already, uh, I mean, get enough of uh, insight from Yahua about narrative writing and how to write science stories. Uh, so I will not share uh, any more about that, but also I will not share about any kind of tips because, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's a huge challenge in digital age to, sh uh, to communicate about science. So instead of tips, I will share some questions which um, maybe you will think after this session and you may contribute to answer those challenges. So first, let me share my presentation. Wow.
anyone can help. Okay. You may can so, um, well, yeah, the Cuffley winner um, in um, storytelling does sometimes okay. need right. help with presentation. <laughs> that is a revelation. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Uh, to give you context uh, about my job in Compass.com, so we are mainstream media, uh, for profit, definitely. It's not non profit media. And we always aim to be the first uh, digital media in Indonesia uh, in terms of profit in terms of readership and of course in terms of qualities so my challenge is here uh i mean my work is a my work here is a i work in a fast place so definitely i don't have privilege to uh to do what was that to have like a man to write a story or conduct an expedition something like that so I work on a daily basis. Uh, I write like maybe four to five stories a day. I'm sure many of you experience this kind of work. Uh, so yeah. Sorry. Okay. Wait, wait. So as a journalist, we were always told that uh, content is the king. So we don't think about uh, how we present the stories. As long as you have a, a good content, a good stories, uh, we think reader will read it. If, we, if we, they don't read it, then maybe they are the one who is lazy or some of us say they are stupid or anything. Uh, and then what consider uh, a good journalism piece? Uh, first should be accurate, comprehensive, cover all sides and all that meets uh, the elements of journalism that Yahoo already shared in the previous presentations. And sometimes we see like, next slide please. If you see this kind of piece, uh, it's long enough, it's dominate the page. Uh, if it is necessary, all the, all the whole page is for you. And the title is short and so eye-catching. And then you say it's a good story, uh, even though you don't read it sometimes. Because uh, if you present a long story to people and then they say, oh, it's good. And if you present them a short story, probably just five paragraph all, then they say it's not in depth, it's not uh, comprehensive and etc. So people tend to value good story as the long one, maybe use complex language. But in digital age, next slide please. Gary. All right, next. Yes, in digital age, uh, people are constantly exposed to information. Uh, we receive debates in social medias and then pop up uh, advertising and then maybe some of news organization uh, promotes, their, promotes their article so that you the pop-up appears in your cell phone and etc. So that uh, we experience so that we experience an information fatigue. Uh, we have a lot of choices, uh, but sadly, uh, we only choose and we have algorithm now which help us to just based on our interest. So if you are interested in science, you probably less, uh, you probably less consume about political news or business. 
And we also have a problem with time span or a short period of attention. Uh, previously, you have like a morning with your coffee and reading newspaper. You may read like 700 words article, but now uh, you continue to juggle with one and two another job work. Uh, when you read an article, maybe your friends text you and then you see your text and then you get back to the article again, you find it not interesting, then you click another article and etc. And there are another platform uh, other than news platform that now it's growing, like the social media, YouTube, uh, like Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, which uh, people use uh, that platform more than uh, just website. So now in Indonesia, for example, there is, I think no one access like www.compass.com or cnnindonesia.com, but they just read to Twitter and, or Instagram and click the available links there. Next. So yeah, and the journalist itself, uh, we experienced the change in digital age, uh, we work in faster page. So for example, uh, if a president uh, gives speech now, you have to publish the most important quotes even before the speech is finished in order to, you know, to gain readership or to be the first in delivering information. And we have meeting all the time. Uh, Back in the old days, maybe you have daily meetings in the morning and the afternoon, but now it's all time meetings on WhatsApp. And our performance now, sadly, it's not only measured by uh, our quality, the quality of our articles, but also how many people read our piece. And there is a contradiction too, uh, like there is a research uh, conducted to uh, journalists from The Guardian and the BBC, that even though many of them disagree with this kind of uh, KPI or uh, how we measure performance by the number of people uh, clicks, uh, the journalists still to, uh, still to um, try to see how many uh, readers, if they, if they see that the, the, the number of, of readers uh, in the article is low, then they feel a bit, a bit depressed. Next. So how should we do journalism? Should we do journalism the way we used to do in digital? It's considering those challenges. Uh, many people uh, in other fields of community Communication, like the advertising now have something called audience first or user-centered uh, communication. Uh, I think uh, in my opinion, uh, in digital age, we, sh we, also, we also should do like user-centered journalism. Next please. But what is it exactly? Is it just about uh, the presentation or is it, or it's also about content? Uh, the practice in the current practice uh, of user-centered journalism, sadly is only based on Google Analytics. So if there's a keyword, Dina trending in, in Twitter, for example, then journalists try to take story about Dina, write story about Dina, anything about Dina. And we forget about the other uh, important issues. Uh, maybe when Gina is trending, there is an illegal logging in Borneo. Then we, for we simply don't write about that because it's not trending and it, it, will, it will not gain a, a lot of readers. Uh, First, uh, user-centered journalism, in my opinion, is about the content itself. Uh, like Yahua present earlier, that uh, one of the elements of the journalism is the, the loyalty to the readers. 
So the kind of loyalty means uh, that we have to serve uh, the information they need. And we also have to filter, uh, like we have to give the most important information for them. But uh, since we live in digital age, uh, of course we can't do uh, journalism like before. We cannot write, write like before. For example, you write a 3,000 words article, you have to think, uh, do you need to write that long? Or can it be shorter? shorter? Next, please. There are some inter interesting facts. Uh, based on surfing in the US, six in 10 people tends to share the story without reading it. And based on our data in compass.com, uh, if your channel, uh, say you work for science section, if your section have three minutes on average uh, time on site, it, it's long enough. It means uh, that's the longest time people stay on an articles. But uh, this is contradiction. We also have a long form channel called GO. Uh, the average time on site is 20 minutes. It means for some interesting sto uh, stories, uh, readers may stay on page longer. And a lot of surface states that people now tends to be more visual. So this is some insight from uh, in the field of journalism. Next. In other field of communication, I mean, outside journalism, we see that gamers population in Southeast Asia is continue growing. And it's predicted to 20, 50 million uh, by 2021. And then we also have a famous platform, Line Webtoons, maybe your children or sister read it. Uh, they have like 100 billion views annually in 2019, I think it's growing. And we also have a, a fiction uh, platform called Wattpad, which has uh, 80 million monthly users globally. And we also have uh, like a hero like Greta Thunberg and Kitanja Lirao, uh, young people uh, who are in very interested enthusiastic in science, and they're nominated as the person of the year. So considering those uh, facts, uh, how can we craft, uh, or how should we craft journalism in the digital age? Uh, next, please. In my experience, there is, Next, please. Uh, this is, uh, the title in English is a bit different. Uh, in, in Indonesia, it means cerita virus buat yang malah serius means for people who are too lazy to be serious. Uh, uh, we know that this pandemic is a serious situation, but uh, uh, we are struggling financially and also psychologically. So there are a lot of research that uh, states that people tend to avoid uh, an update on coronavirus unless it's, the, it's a good news. So based on the, uh, some insights or facts that I saw uh, earlier, uh, I tried to create a uh, uh, kind of uh, a format that is the content is important. It uh, it consists of uh, most important information uh, about coronavirus, but at the same time uh, we present in a way that uh, that is more engaging, that is not confusing. Uh, it's more fun and enjoyable. And why do and why do I choose a comic uh, format? Uh, because as I said earlier, 
uh, Asia is the one of the greatest uh, consumers of comics. Uh, one of the indicators is uh, the number of users in Line Webtoon. And uh, I think in Indonesia as well, uh, the number of uh, people who consume uh, comics is continue growing. And the variants consists of uh, three series. The first and the second uh, episodes is in the form of comics, and the third in the form of new scheme. Uh, it's a it's a new approach uh, in response to uh, the number of uh, gamers that is growing. Uh, we experiment. Uh, we conduct an experiment. Uh, to see if, if if this kind of format can be used for the future of science journalism. And from the other uh, winner, so this is the next uh, sorry. As you can see, uh, there's a button to give it back so that our users can give uh, feedback through surface. And I also conducted like a, a user interview, a uh, virtual user interview. Next, please. Sorry for interrupting, Yunan. You have two minutes left. Okay. And from the other coffee winner, uh, from at Young Peace, for example, how this pandemic will end, uh, we see some interesting fact. Next, please. First, the title, how the how the pandemic will end. It's it's exactly like what people asked about this pandemic. When we, when it will end, and how uh, how can we cope this situation? and so on and the other is it's the uh at young also make a kind of pointer what happened next one what is the end game and others so that readers can uh uh i mean this is he i mean he part uh his article based on the readers questions so from uh, my experience and from the other uh, coffee reader, I think uh, we see that there are a lot of approach uh, to response to the challenge in digital age. And uh, uh, there is no single formula to do it. Uh, we can't say that people, not, people do not read long form anymore. We can't say that visual is always work. Uh, but what can we do is uh, we have to conduct an experiment and to see how our readers uh, respond to our uh, products. And it's not only the number of the parameter is should not only the number of clicks and the number of the number of readers, but also uh, do they understand it? Uh, and will they change uh, because of the because after they read our articles, I think there should be a parameter to 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 measure uh, the impact of our articles. Okay, Dina. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Yunan. This is very interesting because you explain how technology has changed the behavior of users and finally changed, uh, you know, the way journalism operates. And it's interesting because previously Yohua says that we have to be loyal to readers, but then uh, Yunan uh, presented that. Uh, when we loyal, when we are loyal to users, and then we're lo loyal to their behavior uh, in the Google search, and finally neglecting uh, the important issues. Well, this is debatable, 
And I'm sure uh, both of you, Yunan and Yoha, you have uh, your own uh, perspectives and this could go to the next level of uh, journalist debate here. But however, um, I think we're going uh, back to basic because maybe half of the participants here just begin uh, writing their science stories and there are uh, scientists here as well. So before I go to the questions, I think I would like a both of you to answer what is actually the difference between science journalism and science communication? Because somehow people who wants to get into uh, science communication and science journalism often blur between uh, those uh, two different things. And what are your answers for that? Yeah, I'll go with uh, Yoko first. <laughs> okay. can, can I skip the question? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, I, 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 I still tend to struggle with this a bit because sometimes science communicators, they do science journalism. Okay, so for me, the difference would be um, the difference would be, uh, I guess, uh, independence and independence of the journalist, I mean, uh, and verification of your, of, of, of your, of, of what you're reporting. So independence would mean that you are, you're even independent of your, uh, say, for example, I'm a lecturer in a university, right? and I'm doing science communication. But would I ever uh, do a science communication that criticize the research of my own university? Um, would I, you know, when I write a piece about my own work, uh, would I also interview other researchers on their thoughts about my work, you know? Um, so to me, uh, I think that's the most obvious uh, change that, 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 that comes to mind. Um, and I think there's also a difference in what, 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 who people believe in. It used to be that people really trust uh, journalists, uh, at least in the States, I think, um, because they assume that they think that journalists are uh, independent and then they would do a lot of verification of what they report. But if it comes from somebody else, they might think that this person has some sort of like, you know, a vested interest in what they're presenting. So it might not be so independent and uh, I guess reliable, but um, I think Mark Davy also said right in the beginning that you know a lot of people are doing science journalism now. So, so uh, a science communicator can be doing science journalism too. Yeah, and sometimes it's not so easy to differentiate between those two things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yunan, <laughs> your turn. <laughs> okay, so Yunan, what's your answer? The difference, um, hard to say. Uh, for me, I just think the same, the most simple one, the simplest one, like uh, the science communicator, they can't be journalists or scientists or uh, the amateur, like people, they can't be a uh, science communicator, but science journalists are those who, who are doing journalism. But uh, in this pandemic, Era. I mean, it's it's hard to tell the difference uh, which one is science journalist and which one is not because everyone now is science journalist. So for those who are still questioning, maybe those people try to, uh, I mean, they have requirement that maybe some scientists have requirement that uh, demand they some journalist has to master some topic before they conduct interview, for example. But the thing is, uh, in this pandemic situation, uh, many media organizations struggle, and journalists are those who are used to cover politics, economics, now cover science. Of course, uh, they don't have uh, enough knowledge. So, Rather than questioning which one is science communicator, science journalist, and which one is not, I think it's better to, to, what is it, to embrace this moment, uh, to 
promote science journalism to build this ecosystem, the ecosystem of science journalism, I think that's better. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yunan. So for those of you who want to know more uh, about science journalism, um, you can contact um, the Society of Indonesian uh, Science Journalists because uh, what Yunan and Yoha says is actually a uh, complicated to explain that we are always open for those who are curious. So we're, we'll go to um, the questions. The first is for Yoka. It's from Mbak Dewi in CNN Indonesia. How long does it take for you to research, interview, and write uh, the snake bite story, including the editing uh, stage? And then uh, from Fatima, why do why did you choose to write about that? And what made it a story idea that stood out? Um, I think you can you can read that in the. Uh, in the chat box, right? Yep. And the next is from uh, Kuka uh, in the, the Jakarta Post, and he's, and he asked whether you know, do you think a narrative journalism can work for a story that is shorter, like less than one thousand and five hundred? And he also asked, do you think we're allowed to make up small details for the scenes? Or this is also a question that I often think about. Oh, please, Yoha. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for the question. So uh, I'll get to uh, uh, David's uh, questions first. So I just look it up just now. Um, for the snake bite story itself, um, it it started with a chat, uh, a face to face chat with uh, Dr. Tri Maharani in Kuala Lumpur, and that was in March. So the whole story took place last year. So that was so I I I met her and we had like a thirty minute, forty five minute kind of a chat. Um, in March, then I pitched the story to Mosaic in May. It got commissioned at the end of May. Then I uh, went to uh, I went to East Java um, in October. Uh, I went to J I went to Java twice. Okay, all together five days, and that was all in October. And then about 16 or 14 days after that, I submitted my draft, my first draft. Okay. So I finished my reporting in October. I, and then I took uh, about two weeks to sort of uh, organize my notes. And then I wrote it. Um, actually, the writing was really quick. Uh, it was like one and a half days. And, and I wrote it. Um, so, and then it was published in, I think, if I remember, like early December or something. It was supposed to publish a few months after that, but then, you know, Mosaic had to sort of like close its operations very fast. So, so everything was uh, expedited. So from March on the first chat to uh, draft in October, and then it published in early December, if I remember correctly. So that was the timeline. Yeah. Um, as to Fatima's question, um, actually I should say like not all narrative stories would take that long. Some could take far longer. Some doesn't take that long, yeah. The, a lot of it was like arranging the logistics, the arranging the, the visit and then things like that. Okay, so as to Fatima's story, like why the snake bite story? Um, it was, uh, I felt like it was also a neglected issue. Um, and then the people were dying. Um, and it, to me, um, there seems to be, you know, like easy solutions at hand, you know. That, and, there's, and very importantly, so there, there was somebody like doing, doing all the, putting in all this effort. So that's Dr. Sri Maharani. And, um, and I've spoken to her. She's really, you know, animated, very passionate. And it's definitely like an awesome character for such a, a narrative writing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a boring character would be very difficult to use, but a, a character like Dr. Sri Maharani is like, like just perfect. So I was like, okay, this is an awesome story. But where's the hook? Where's, this is like an Indonesian story. Like, you know, it, to, to bring it up, like, but at the, at the same time, you know, the, the World Health Organization has just released this, like, uh, I think 12 year or 15 year plan to on snake bite management. So World Health Organization is doing something global on it. So this information story could easily, you know, sort of hook onto that. And uh, so it all worked out very well. But to me personally, I felt that um, it's an important issue. And the solution seems quite easy. And there's like somebody very interesting who's already doing 
so much effort. So I felt that, yeah, this, is, this makes a good story. As to Kuka's question, um, yes, less than 1,500 words, of course it can work, and, and there are good narrative journalism that, that does that. Um, it's just a matter of filtering what is important, as Yunan said, like what is really key details, um, and then you, you do it. Yes, you can do it. Even for a very short piece, like 300 words, you can do it. Uh, if you're writing a profile of somebody, you can still use it. You just have to be a lot more selective. Sorry. And then last question. Um, no, you cannot make things up. Yeah, you cannot make things up. Because once you make up one detail, and, and if people spot that one detail, it, uh, it doesn't even matter if people knows that you knew, knew that you make it up or not, but you yourself know that you made it up, right? Your, your confidence, your integrity will be so destroyed as a journalist. Like, and then you probably look at every other piece with a lot of like cynicism, like ah, this is probably made up, you know, it's not true. How could they know this detail? Because you yourself have done it. So you would not trust anybody else. So for example, in the opening piece of my snake bite story, I wrote about the sun setting. I, I was not there when the, the snake bite happened like two years ago. So it was all reconstructed from my interview with the farmer. But during my interview with him, I asked him, when did it happen? He said, oh, about this time. And at the time when he spoke to him, the sun has already set. But when it, hit, when it beat him, you know, two years ago, has the sun already set? I cannot just assume that it did. But I knew it happened around seven o'clock. So I need to go look on the internet you know, there are, there are websites where they show you day rise, sunset, sunrise uh, in specific locations for specific time. I had to go look for that date on, in that location. What's the sunrise and sunset? So I knew at the time, sun has set. Yeah. So that was my backup, my evidence. So, you no, know, you don't make things up. You don't combine two characters into one character. Yeah. You, you really got to report it as it is and back it up. Because there's fact checker also. <laughs> there's fact checker. Yeah, okay. I think that's all the questions for me. Thanks. Okay. Wow. So the writing process was about one and a half day? Uh, the writing itself? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. It, 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 yeah, because all the reporting was already neatly organized and it's, I, I, I felt the story and I just wrote it. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So we'll go to questions for Yunan. Um, the, the first is from ba, uh, Dewi. Oh, sorry, from um, Mbak Diana. Um, Mbak Diana says, um, could you explain why people uh, right now tend to be more visual? And from Mbak Dewi, uh, how long does it take to prepare, write, and publish uh, the variant series? Also, the last is from Mbak Digita. And how did you survey before create the story game? And should it, should it take time before you uh, in the story? I mean, maybe Mbak Bigeta was asking the same like Mbak Dewi. So yeah, please, Yunan. Okay, uh, first uh, Mbak Diana's questions. Why people tend to be more visual? Uh, I think the exact answer you should ask to anthropologists and neuroscientists. But based on uh, some research, uh, to process visual, like to process an image, uh, our brain only needs like a quarter of seconds. So it's very short periods. Whereas for the text, it needs longer. For example, if you describe uh, accident, uh, you can tell as easily uh, who, is, who are involved in the accident, where is it, and what time is it in an image uh, whereas in text uh, maybe it needs like 250 words definitely you need more than one second to read it and the second also I think uh, it's not only people nowadays that like visual communication but I think human always tends to uh, tends to enjoy visual more uh, one of the evidence is, uh, I think, uh, anyone knows uh, the rock art in Sulawesi, which, uh, which is like, like 44,000 years old. It's a form of visual communication as well. And it's only dif uh, different, uh, in the old days, people create like a, a painting or relief. And now we create a photograph or animations 
uh, but it's still a visual. So I think it's not a new trend. It's just uh, digital makes it possible to uh, what what is it to revive as a new form of uh, as a form of communications. And how long does it take for the variant series? For the comic series, it's very short. It's just uh, I think I need around three days uh, to collect data and interviews and around two days or three days to create a script. And the creative team, they need like uh, a week to, to do the, the animation and uh, coding and etc. and publish. And for the new scheme, it takes longer because it's more complex in terms of uh, scenario. Uh, I have to like, uh, I have to ask more detail to the scientists. Like for example, if if we choose uh, a DNA vaccine, what will happen? Then I have to uh, write all of the consequences. Uh, if we choose uh, like protein vaccine, what will happen? And the question are more detailed than uh, you know. Sometimes if you write uh, an article, you just ask uh, which one is the um, which one is the who is the best one and it's enough. For this, uh, you have to explain when one by one. So it takes longer. I think it takes around two weeks to do the, the interview itself. Uh, and then to create scenario, yeah, around two weeks as well. Because actually this is my first time to create this kind of form of communication. And then the creative team needs around uh, three to four weeks to to do the coding and visualization. So in total, it's around six six weeks or seven weeks to do that. It, it takes longer than uh, other form of content. And from Brigitta, uh, how did you? Sorry, how did you? How did you do the variant? Oh, the survey. The survey. Yeah. So first, uh, I conduct research uh, on what kind of uh, what platform of vaccine that's available now, uh, from the older one to the to the, to the latest one. So it means from the inactivated vaccine to the uh, DNA vaccine. Uh, their weakness and the strength, and the strength, and then and I cross check with the scientists uh, about the the benefit and the weakness of each platform, and then uh, I ask again to the scientists and uh, read all the data from the World Health Organization uh, about who is uh, doing uh, like DNA vaccine and other kind of vaccine nowadays to uh to tackle coronavirus pandemic and then from that uh i create kind of a chart uh this vaccine this is the effect and and this is the side effect and others and and then i divide it into kind of scenarios uh if we choose scenario like dna vaccine what will happen so I explained one by one, and then I presented to creative teams. Uh, and as for the opinion, is it is it is it good enough to be called game? Because you know it's not it's not a it's not mm, it's not game as in you know mobile legend or uh, Pokemon, of course. And then, uh, and we discussed like uh, what kind of game that we want to make. Uh, if it is for this series uh, theme, is it possible uh, to to create like uh, what is it a text based game? Uh, uh, do people still are people? still interested in that 
kind of uh, game because a text-based game is basically the oldest version of game. And now uh, game are really, they are 3D, VR, and then do people still consume this kind of game? And apparently, yes, there are some communities that uh, still consume that kind of game. And even uh, there is a game called, uh, I think, Sorcery, Sorcery, uh, which one like a uh, meaningful play, uh, kind of competition uh, in the US for game content. So then we decided, uh, okay, so we, so we created that kind of game. Uh, but then in, in game, uh, usually you will have a score or level or uh, kind of a reward if you win it. Uh, but the thing is, in this kind of uh, situation, the situation in, you know, in vaccine development, uh, at the time the game was made, uh, we still don't know yet which one is the best, which uh, platform is the best for uh, Indonesia. So obviously we cannot make, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, scoring or grading and obviously we cannot decide uh, what kind of uh, the winning scenario so instead of uh, instead of uh, uh, you know giving score uh, we try to introduce uh, a certain kind of frustration uh, because obviously if you if you were scientists you are frustrated by this pandemic because you know you have to do research on vaccine in a very short period six to 12 months uh, and it has to uh, it must work uh, and safe enough so it's a huge uh, challenges so we try to mimic uh, this kind of frustration uh, in the game uh, by uh, asking readers uh, uh, to try one by one of uh, the scenario. And there is some trap in the game as well. Uh, for example, if you skip the warning, uh, you will get a kind of ticket and you have to uh, return to the, uh, the initial, uh, to, the start, to the start page. Yeah, so it's a long, a long process, a long process. And to share the result, uh, I mean, even though it win a competition, it doesn't mean uh, it works. So some readers uh, complain about the frustration. So I, I play games uh, and I didn't feel like I win the games. Uh, yeah, because they expect they expect to win, obviously. And then some readers say, uh, "Okay, this is not a game. This is just I don't know a tax. Uh, this is too. There are too much tax to be called game. Yeah, and there there are some complaints, but for us, it's a good. Uh, it was a good experiment, and we value the our readers' feedback, and yeah, we try to create more in the future. Okay, so you heard about uh, the comments, you said that the readers said that it's not a game, too much facts, etc. Did yes. you hear that after it is published or you um, did some surveys before that, before publishing? So after it published, because the game itself uh, is part, was part of my dissertation, Mm -hmm. So I conduct uh, something called A-B testing. So I compare a uh, text article with a uh, new scheme content. Both of them uh, 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 consist of, sim of the similar content. And uh, I test which one has more engagement and which, which one has higher uh, memory retention. It means, uh, so basically I give them quiz uh, and then they answer 
and which one has a higher score? Is it, is it the game content or the text content? Mm, okay. So I after after it published, uh, I show you uh, the the feedback button. Readers can give feedback, and then after that, uh, I conducted an interview with some readers mm. to get more uh, to get their insight more. Uh, mm. And then yeah, some some readers give that kind of comments. Okay. So there's a question from Fatima actually uh, that touched yeah. uh, this stage of, about developing uh, the animation series. So Fatima is wondering, uh, what do you mean with uh, you task before you finalize it? Now we uh, learn uh, from your uh, earlier explanation that uh, you actually, it, it, is, it was part of your uh, dissertation. You interviewed uh, scientists, you, ask opinion from gamers and also uh, you um, experimented to, to, to readers. So um, Fatima would like to know what information in particular that you want to get from the experiment. Maybe it's before the publication. Can you explain it once again? Uh, sorry, yeah, I should correct this. I tested or I experimented it after it published. So okay. after I finalized it and publish in compass.com and basically we want to know our readers comments so what kind of question did we ask uh, in user research uh, there are many uh, platform of questionnaire uh, there are especially in game there is game gaming engagement questionnaire and then gaming experience questionnaire and then there is one that it's more general called user engagement questionnaire so basically, this kind of questionnaire developed by uh, scientists, those who study human-computer interaction or uh, digital communication, and each uh, each uh, platform of questionnaire has been validated, so it can be used to conduct uh, any kind of experiment uh, within this field. So. In my experiment, I just use user engagement questionnaire because uh, first I want to compare the text and the news game content. If I just like gaming engagement questionnaire, then I, I cannot apply that for the text content. So the questionnaire itself uh, consists of 31 questions, uh, basically 31 statements, and reader has to rank um, the what is it, the response from one to five. So one of the question is, uh, do, you, do you enjoy this content or do, do you immerse in the contents? And then do you feel like you are, you, that time flies by when you read this content, something like that. Mm. So based on that, based on that questionnaire, uh, we, get, we have a rating from one to five. Mm. Uh, and then for the memory retention, uh, we give a uh, 10 questions to the readers about the content uh, in the game and in, in the text. Uh, 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 for example, uh, why, is, why, is the, why is protein vaccine or recombinant vaccine is the best approach for uh, Indonesia. It's a multiple choice question, so A, B, C, D. So, and then after that, we we give score to every uh, response, and then we measure the average. In the end of the uh, uh, experiment, we compare uh, which one has higher score between the text and the news game. Interesting. I hope you, that answered your questions. Yeah. Um, so, uh, do you think that it's only science that can be developed into such an interactive game like that? You said that there are a potential, you know, there are candidates, vaccine candidates. We have four and each have their own side effects, uh, their own histories. Is it something that is unique to a science story so we can make uh, that um, interactive games or do you think it can be applied in other kind of journalism? Yeah, I think it's, it can be applied to 
any kind of journalism. Uh, I mean, it could be for business. And in fact, uh, a new scheme has been developed like 20 years. Uh, it's since I think early 2000s uh, by a scientist called named Ian Bogus. You may Google his name. Uh, and then it, it applies first in the politics, uh, political journalism. So uh, my per my purpose, my objective was like, uh, okay, I'm a science journalist, but now journalism in general face challenges. So how can I how can I contribute to my field, which is science journalism and journalism in general? So that's why I choose, you know, that new scheme. Okay. For my, and I think I need to stress that game and comics, it's also form of narrative journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a, what is it? What is it called? A character, character in it. And you need to develop, for example, you know, for one panel of comic, you need to know uh, when uh, when uh, kind of a uh, phenomena or, or accident happen, where is it, and who are involved, and yeah. for people who are involved in the situation, uh, how is their characteristic? You have to visual visualize it. So I think it's a form of narrative journalism only in the in its in different format. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, just like we create a comic out of a novel. Um, so it's very interesting. So before we close uh, our session, I think um, there's one question that I'd like to ask to you, Yunan and Yohua. Um, the question is <laughs> the first that I mentioned in, in my opening. Uh, for you as a science journalist, when you have a scientific paper, what elements do you take first to create a story of it? So this is for uh, people who wants to uh, first dive into science journalism and science communication. What is your advice for that? Okay, Yohua. All right. Um, so I, do, do you mean like how do you interpret the, 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 the paper or like how do you find the story in the paper? Which, which uh, more like how do you find the story in the paper and what elements uh, that we should take? Hmm. All right, okay. Um, well, uh, how do you find the story in the paper? Well, basically, you, I guess you, you definitely need to know what's the significance of the paper first, right? Like what's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the important point of the paper? Um, and to do that, you basically just quickly read the results and then like the first few paragraphs of the discussion section. Usually, now almost all scientists would write, will brag about how important the, the study is in the first few paragraphs of their discussion section. So once you read that, you get an idea from the author's point of view why they are, what their study is about and why it matters. So then is there a story there? Is there a story worth telling? then you would have to do your own reporting to see what have others found. Is this a significant uh, finding in the field? Or is it a significant finding? Or is it like a, a finding that is really different from all the others? Um, or perhaps it's a finding that is very unique to this uh, locality. Um, I'm saying that because uh, if you're basing it on, if your story is a one study story, just based on one study, usually it will be a new story then, um, then it has to be timely, there has to be a good hook to it. Otherwise, the editors won't take it. So, so yeah, I think that would be my take. Yeah, you got, just got to see what's significant about it. Yeah. Okay, so or the whether first, was timely. Yeah. The first few paragraphs in the discussion session, right? Usually, yeah, usually, yeah. Okay, so Yunan, uh, what do you think? So, usually I just see the abstract. Uh, first paragraph of introduction and then the result part. But I suggest if you are uh, if you are new to scientific paper and you never cover science based on scientific paper only, uh, 
I suggest you to ask some scientists after you find some paper. Uh, I mean, if it if it is uh, if there is a new things in the paper in the research, or is uh, is it good enough, or is it influential enough to be written? Uh, I think from that you can you can get a kind of perspective. I suggest not only write based on paper if you if you are new. In okay. The field. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yunan and Yohualo, for your time. This has been a very interesting uh, discussion. And I hope you guys uh, already find um, solutions and useful tips and information to get for those who just begin their uh, journalism career to get into the science journalism. and. For those of you who are already uh, a journalist, uh, we hope that uh, you can insert more science elements in your stories. And um, okay, I think that's all. Um, we we have been recording uh, this session, and our society will upload it in our YouTube channel, and we will send it send the link uh, in the email. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gyohua and Yunan, and for everyone here, stay in touch. Um, we, the Society of Indonesian Science Journalists, is very keen to make strong connections to other Southeast Asian journalists, so please follow uh, our Twitter. And we're also there uh, in Facebook, but it's still a close group, so maybe Twitter uh, will be uh, much useful. Okay, that's all. I think I close this discussions. Bye, everyone. Bye.